Thank you, and good afternoon, good evening, and a very early good morning to our friends who are just having their first cup of coffee on the other side of the world. I'm Edith Wilson, and I am delighted to welcome you to the second session of the Critical Minerals webinar series hosted by the Society of Economic Geologists. We are an international scientific association devoted to advancing the science, discovery, and responsible development of mineral resources. Today's topic is exploration and mining of energy storage materials, and we're delighted to welcome four panelists who are going to share their career stories and expertise with everyone today. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to the public on the archived event page of the SEG website, as well as on the SEG YouTube channel. So Deanne, may I have the next slide, please? So this is today's agenda. I'd like to first start with a special welcome to our students and early career professionals we're hoping that these discussions with these inspiring members of the economic geology community who are working specifically on energy resources will provide you with information you need to survive and thrive in this changing world as we all navigate the new energy economy together. We're going to begin as we continue to gather and bring in additional participants we're going to begin with a poll of our, um, of our participants and panelists. You can participate in the poll as well. This will come on screen shortly. Um, and um, I also would like to remind you that we are recording the webinar and it will be um, uh, available uh, after, the, um, after the webinar on the archives on the SEG website. So here's our first poll question. Which best describes where you currently are in your career? Just work through these questions, and after we have a significant percentage of responses, we will um, walk through the answers together. Um, again, welcome everyone. We are looking forward to hearing comments from Marie Hitzman, Felipe Gallardo, Andrew Scoggins, and Joel Romchuk. So please um, answer your poll questions, which I am also going to do. Um, and we will hear the responses shortly. Don't forget to click submit at the end. And then you will see the um, survey go away. And as soon as we have a majority of the participants who've completed the poll, we'll begin to see the answers on our screen. Again, a big welcome to the now almost 150 participants who have joined us from all parts of the globe. Um, we're delighted to have you all here today. The webinar is being recorded and it will be available post-webinar on the SEG website in the archived presentations, as well as on the SEG YouTube channel. Aha, we have our polling results. So we are seeing a wide variety of uh, where we sit in our careers, almost a bell curve there, that's really beautiful. Um, and uh, an additional variety of ages with an emphasis on uh, a, a, early career demographic, which is great. Um, a bit of a North American slant to where we sit geographically, but with a little bit of representation from all across the globe, that's amazing. Um, and we have students, employed professionals looking for employed and retired. So a nice variety of perspectives and viewpoints. And with that, I am going to close the poll results on my screen. And we will continue. I'm going to just briefly review the agenda for you. Um, and then we will continue with um, the webinar. Uh, the, um, excuse me one second. Ah, there we go. Okay, um, 
We will begin with um, our panelists who are going to introduce themselves, and then we will have a Q&A session. I want to remind you, please, to put your Q&A, your questions as they come up throughout the seminar. Please put them in the Q&A box, um, and they will be visible to all participants, and you will be able to upvote questions um, that you see already in the panel. Um, so, Deanne, may we have uh, the next slide, please? Many of you were with us for our first episode um, of this series, which was an overview of the energy supply chain of critical minerals, where we talked about everything from mine to market um, with our three panelists. Today's, um, and, and if you missed that session, you'll be able to see that um, in the archived uh, collection of events on the SEG website. Today, we're going to focus on the first piece of the chain. We're going to focus on mining efficiently and sustainably with proper social license. And we're going to focus on, may I have the next slide please, Ian? We're going to focus on four particular critical minerals to the energy supply chain. And these are cobalt, lithium, graphite, and nickel. And I've just thrown up a few world maps based on the USGS uh, critical mineral summaries that come out each year. These are from 2020 um, to show you in highlighted color the countries of production of the four minerals, as well as in graduated symbols, the relative percentage of the market um, that is produced in those countries. So what we see is a wide disparity from cobalt with a gross market of about 140,000 metric tons, but the bulk of that coming out of the Democratic Republic of Congo. Lithium, very similar, a smallish market, although that's predicted to triple in the coming decade, um, but with a little more diversity of supply, still the lion's share coming from spodumene deposits in Australia, um, but a goodly portion from the lithium triangle in South America, which we'll hear about today, um, and some from China um, and other parts of the world. What's really exciting to me is to see um, lithium production as well as cobalt production and graphite uh, beginning to spring up in parts of Africa and other places around the world where it hasn't been before. Moving on to graphite in the pink, we see a wide distribution of production, but with a heavy lump coming out of China, um, but a growing portion out of the mines in Mozambique, which are um, a very interesting deposit of graphite. Nickel, of course, um, the market for nickel is much broader than just for energy storage. We also have um, uh, the draw on nickel from the steel industry and other industries, um, and also a much, uh, a very wide diversity of supply dominated by Indonesia and the Philippines for sure, um, but with some nickel supply um, on most of the continents outside of Africa. So with that overview, Deanne, we'll move along to the next slide, please. I'm going to call on our first panelist, Murray Hitzman from Dublin, um, to give us his um, uh, story of his career and a little bit of insight into Cobalt. Thank you, Edith, and thank you to the SEG for asking me to come. I think this is a really neat series that the society is doing and, and really important as well. So I'm Murray Hitzman. I'm uh, right now an academic a professor at University College Dublin and uh, director of the ICRAG uh, Research Center. I have a checkered career, I guess is the best way to put it. Uh, I actually grew up in the oil fields. My family worked, my father and my grandfather worked in the oil industry. Uh, I swore I would not become a geologist, went off and got my first degree in anthropology, um, but there was no way to actually uh, do research where I wanted to do research, which is in Central America. So it turned out our geology department ran their field trip, their field course there. So I basically became a geologist so I could get to Central America to do my anthropology field work. At the same time, uh, the geology field course was pretty good. We got to map active volcanoes. We got to swim across the reef in Belize. Uh, I sort of got hooked. So after that, I ended up doing a master's and a PhD in Alaska uh, in the far north in the Brooks Range. And after that, uh, went to work Chevron Corporation, 
doing primarily minerals work, but working with the oil industry with, with our oil lab, worked all around the world, uh, ended up uh, in Ireland, where I'm back there now, and found the mine that's behind me on my image, the Lachine mine in Ireland, and helped uh, bring it to production. After that, uh, I decided to do something totally different, so I applied for a Geologic Society of America fellowship to the U.S. Senate and was lucky enough to get it. Went to work for an unknown senator named Joseph Lieberman. Uh, worked as a policy analyst in the Senate, mainly working on environmental uh, legislation, and then was asked to do a fellowship in the White House and worked for two years for the Clinton administration, primarily with Vice President Gore and the Office of Science and Technology Policy on climate change. After that, I was still actually technically on leave from Chevron, but I was asked to uh, apply for an academic position at Colorado School of Mines. I did. Uh, I ended up staying 20 years. Uh, this is all because I should say my wife is Irish. When we left for Washington the first time from Dublin, I told her it would be a year. Um, 25 years later, I, I actually am back in Ireland finally and uh, working on some of the things I started a long time ago. I've been interested in cobalt for a number of years. My PhD was on a deposit called Ruby Creek, which is a copper cobalt deposit in the Brooks Range. And so I've had a fascination with it since then. And the last 25 years, I've been working in the Central African Copper Belt, uh, trying to understand why it is the world's biggest source of cobalt. Um, I'm now still working on that. And I'm technical advisor for open disclosure for a company called Cobalt Metals which is using machine learning and artificial intelligence to actually look for cobalt around the world. So next, I guess. All right, do we do our next slide next, Edith? Yes, Deanne will take care of that for you. Great, so cobalt. Uh, cobalt is a fascinating metal. Um, it wasn't found until quite late. Uh, it's something that you know people didn't know what it was. Um, it is a silvery gray metal. It is uh, used in many, many applications but it has become very prominent in just the last 10 years, I'd say, because of what it does in batteries. And it is, it's, it's, the chemistry of cobalt makes it perfect for the types of batteries we're using, rechargeable batteries in particular, and batteries that'll go in electric vehicles. So cobalt is, as you just mentioned, uh, basically comes over 50% of it, 55% comes from one country, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, another 5% from mines adjacent in Zambia. And then the rest is pretty much spread around the world and in, into a different number of different jurisdictions. Um, but it is you know, very much focused in this one area. Um, the geology is fascinating. Uh, it occurs basically in, in sort of two major ways. In Africa, it's occurring in sediment hosted stratiform copper deposits of the copper belt and the pictures I have below are from there. It also occurs in mafic, ultramafic layered complexes and other mafic and ultramafic rocks. And so it occurs in laterites and in some large copper nickel deposits, which I'm sure we'll, we'll hear more from later on the nickel talk from our other speakers in terms of places like Norilsk and Sudbury. Um, I'm not sure if I want to say any more. I think that's probably enough. I'll wait for the questions on cobalt. That's okay. Thank you. Thank you, Murray. That was perfect. That's a lovely introduction. I appreciate it. And um, before I turn it over to Felipe Gallardo, I'd like to offer that I have put the LinkedIn information for all of our panelists in the chat and uh, hope that you will all use this opportunity not to just listen to what they have to say today, but to contact them uh, at, at any time and, and continue the connection beyond this seminar. So now it's time to hear from Felipe, please go ahead. Thank you very much, Eve, and uh, thank you very much to all the SEG uh, group, all the team. Uh, for me, it's an honor to be here uh, sharing this same panel with all the specialists in all these areas. And uh, so thank you much for the invitation. And uh, I hope I don't come up with too many English unexistent words. So <laughs> just to begin with my introduction, I'll try to make it as brief as possible. Uh, I am a geologist. I also hold um, a master's in science degree in geology too. And uh, my early years in the career, I, I focused on this tectonics and structural geology topics. 
I, I always loved to go out to the field and uh, look at the mountains and notice that mountains were not just that picture we used to draw when we were kids, but they had so much information that uh, I really wanted to understand what was happening there. So that's why I, I was interested in that topic. Uh, during that time, I also participated in the development of a, a ge geological map in, for the Chilean Nat National Geological and Mining Service, uh, which was part of my master thesis. And uh, after that, I also started working as an assistant professor for another university. But during those, ye those years, I noticed uh, maybe some of you also came to this, uh, this uh, stage, but I noticed that something was missing for me. And uh, maybe, uh, in, in fact, I didn't really, I, I wasn't sure at the moment if I really wanted to continue with the uh, geological studies. Uh, so I decided to just take a break. That's why I, I went to traveled abroad. I had a working, I went on a working holiday program to Germany. And uh, Germany was uh, my, I decided to go to Germany because as you might know, Germany, in Germany you can study for free or almost for free. So I, I, it was probably a, a, a possibility for me to study something else, either in the geological topics <laughs> related to ge geology or, or even something totally new. I was, I was open to study even something totally new. Uh, the thing is after that whole year, uh, some some of the plant things uh, went out. Some others uh, didn't work out at all. Uh, but uh, the thing is that when I came back, I was called by a friend of mine. Uh, we we had worked before with with her in this uh, geological map I told you before, and uh, she told me there was this position in SQM. They were looking for a field geologist, so I applied and uh, I got accepted, of course. And uh, here here I am. <laughs> It, it, it was quite uh, interesting also because uh, it was really unexpected. I never expected to be working in a lithium company when, well, the SQM has other, other in, interest in other minerals, but uh, lithium was the, the first, the second, and the third priority at that moment. So it's really unexpected for me in being, you know, living in a country where copper is the main extraction or, or why it's mainly known. And, uh, and also because I was a geologist, I was supposed to work on a, on a project related to potash exploration. And uh, actually that project never even happened. I was soon, soon after I, I came, I started working at the company. I, I was moved to another group for exploring brine in the, in the Salar de Gama. And so I started working as an hydrogeologist uh, uh, important to say is that I never had uh, an hydrogeology course before. So everything I know now has been learned during these past four years. And uh, for me, at least, it's been really great. I've learned a lot about uh, hydrogeology. And uh, I've been part of different projects inside this, this whole Palar Datagama uh, environment, both related to production and exploration, of course, and also environmental uh, assessment. Um, I'm currently finishing a, a degree course in groundwater hydrology, so I'll, I'll finally be able to say that I'm an hydrogeologist. <laughs> uh, could you please go to the next slide, uh, Uh So just to give you a, a brief introduction about uh, the place where I work at, um, the question I would like to answer is where is this salar Atacama? When we talk about a salar, we're talking about a salt flat, that's the translation. And uh, this salt flat is located in Northern Chile, in South America. It's really huge. I mean, you, we're talking about uh, 35 kilometers at least uh, in uh, width. And uh, the salt Atacama is really interesting too because it, it's not just extracting brine wherever you want. You need to know where brine is located. So we can, I can give you this uh, general division on, of the basin. Uh, we, we, we extract brine from the nucleus, which is the central part of the salar, and uh, that's mainly on a light craft surface, just like the picture below, <laughs> the one in, down there. And uh, the, this nucleus is surrounded by a marginal zone, which is uh, the place where the, the environmental 
protect areas are located and uh, where you can find some vegetation too. And then you have this alluvial zone, mainly in the east, uh, which is just like the picture of, above there, uh, no vegetation and almost all, and um, and where and that's the place where we can extract water. So if you can go to the next slide, please. It, it's really important uh, to just to finish this introduction uh, to make an important difference between water and brine. Uh, we talk about this brine system, which is located in the nucleus reservoir. And we like to make the difference between the nucleus reservoir, uh, understanding it like a mining resource, and the alluvial aquifer where, the, where, water, where you can extract water. Uh, so brine is actually not, not water, it's a really, really saline solution uh, to make uh, just air. Uh, sea water is really salty. Then we're talking when we're talking about brine. Uh, we're talking about uh, ten times or eight times at least saltier than salt water uh, than sea water. And um, and uh, well, there are a lot of information. There is a lot of information here. But I would just I would like to transmit to you is that uh, as geoscientists um, studying and, and proposing places where to extract brine to, for lithium production. We are at the beginning of this chain, at the beginning of this production chain, and uh, we have to be able to to find and locate the exact locate the exact place where we should uh, drill the next hole, so the next well, so that uh, the chemistry and the and the flow rates of that hole are consistent with with, with what the production plant needs. So as geoscientists, we are all the time participating in this uh, circle I, I draw there. And uh, we have to be uh, concerned about environmental monitoring and uh, doing uh, flow and transport models and planning uh, every time where the next uh, well has to be drilled. Uh, so just to, just to finish, uh, analysis is really, really important. We are, we are not only hydrogeologists or geologists, but we are at the same time uh, data analysts. And uh, we have to work with other people from other disciplines. And uh, we have to, we, have, we can talk about this later, but the big difference of this system bit, uh, compared to others is that the system is dynamic in the sense that it's not the same to uh, drill a hole and extract a piece of rock uh, or drill a hole and extract water. If you extract water, you need to be uh, concerned about what's happening in your surroundings because you can, uh, you can make the the system move on, in a human time scale. <laughs> so that's to make it brief. Uh, I hope there are more questions later. Thank you, Felipe. That's fantastic. And uh, I, I also put a note in the chat and will remind you all that these slides, of course, will be available um, in the recorded version of the webinar. So um, all of this information will be at your fingertips on the SCG website. Um, we're going to continue introducing our panelists and our mineral topics by um, hearing from Andrew Scoggins from, and he is joining us from Perth. Andrew, over to you. Uh, good day, <clears throat> Edith and Murray. Thanks for uh, inviting me to help out with this. I'm really happy to do so. I'm probably the one oddball out here being an industrial minerals geologist, I guess. I call myself a failed uh, metals uh, geologist. I uh, grew up in South Africa, worked in some Vitvatus Ront deep level gold mines. I've worked in chromite mines uh, in the early days of my career. And I really got into uh, industrial minerals by accident because I was working with a geologist who was completely colorblind. And he'd got into industrial minerals because industrial minerals are often very subtle shades of white, beige, and what have you. And he found he could actually distinguish those colors really well. So he got me into industrial minerals. And um, I've been doing industrial minerals work for probably the last 30 plus years. Um, worked all over the show. Had a bit of a checkered career. At one time, I lost my job and opened up a toy shop, which I had for about three years. <laughs> uh, something a bit different. Um, helped with learning how to deal with customers because um, after that, I went to work for an industrial minerals company in South Africa and was their sales manager. So I've kind of seen things from 
exploration through mining, processing, and product development to selling the final product. Um, you can see there that I've worked on a number of different minerals. Currently, I'm a um, consultant, sort of semi-retired, I suppose, and working in, with a number of minerals. And a particular interest here, graphite, I've been working on for probably the last five or six years since the graphite rush started to 2012, that's even longer, 2013, when the guys were looking for the for that very big graphite deposit in Mozambique. I think we could probably move to the next slide, please. Okay, there's a graph that, uh, as was highlighted earlier by Edith, um, China still produces the lion's share of natural graphite. My focus is natural graphite, by the way, so I haven't got anything on synthetic graphite yet. Um, China producing about three quarters of the world. Uh, we do have Mozambique that sort of had some ups and downs with production, suffering very low prices. They've managed to get going and then had to shut down last year, partly because of the COVID uh, story. And followed by Brazil, North Korea is a bit of an unknown, but I do believe they're bigger at producing graphite than we think. And what's graphite used for? Where does its name come from? It actually comes from a, a Greek word, graphene, which means to write. And I'd like to just show you here, there's a lump of natural graphite and it actually does work as you can probably see. And that's the graphite. That's natural graphite, high grade stuff from uh, Germany. And it gets used for a whole lot of things, including batteries because graphite is conductive, it conducts heat, it conducts electricity. It's a very unusual industrial mineral in that regard. And the other thing to point out, it is an allotrope of carbon. And interestingly, the diamonds are one of the, are carbon, as you know, and they're the hardest known mineral, natural mineral, and graphite's the softest known mineral. So both ends of the spectrum. And graphite gets used to make things like these crucibles, uh, gets used in metallurgical applications for melting things, brake linings, lubricants, and graphite foil, which most computers should have them to conduct uh, heat. Um, if we have a look at the pictures on the bottom right of the slide, one of my sort of uh, <laughs> hobby horses is the fact that not all graphite is created equal. People have found a lot of graphite around the world uh, you know, billions of tons of resources, there's hundreds of millions of tons of in situ graphite. But what really matters is the geo the mineralogy. And you can see there that I've got some pictures, both with the same magnification. The one's got two populations of graphite, one very fine and the other a bit bigger. And then the one on the right is from a, you can see just graphically how big the graphite flakes are. And you could imagine they'd be very easy to extract. Uh, the photo at the bottom is a graphite mine in China. In China. Uh, flake graphite, I didn't mention, normally occurs in metamorphic rocks, uh, gneisses and uh, schists. And then the piece of rock on the right is vein graphite. That's this one here, which you can probably see. That's um, very pure graphite and quartz from veins in Sri Lanka. And I just wanted to show you this one here too, which is also some vein graphite called needle graphite from Sri Lanka. So you can see it occurs in a number of different forms. And by the way, that's from Mozambique. That's flat graphite and the graphitic nice. So uh, I think that's for me, the big thing about graphite is it gets used in a wide variety of markets, not only batteries, although that's probably the growing market and that it's physical, um, the way that it occurs physically really does have an impact on what you can use it for. So I'm done. Thank you very much. Great, Andrew. Thank you. Um, before I uh, move on to our next panelist introduction, I want to remind everyone there are lots of questions popping up in the Q&A. Please put your questions in the Q&A, not the chat. And if you see a question already there that you would like answered, instead of repeating it, just upvote it and uh, it will make it pull to the top of the pile. So don't forget to ask your questions and 
Thank you very much, Andrew. Dean, I think we can go to the next slide. Um, Joel, over to you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And I'd like to start by saying uh, thank you very much to Edith and to the SEG for inviting me to speak with, uh, with these uh, great panelists and uh, to share a little bit about uh, myself, my career, and, uh, and, and uh, nickel, uh, nickel and, and uh, copper cobalt uh, in the magmatic setting. Um, so uh, I'll begin with a little uh, introduction of how I got, uh, I got here in my career. Um, I'm currently the head of, a, uh, of geoscience uh, generative for metals exploration for, for BHP uh, in Toronto, Canada. And uh, I am Canadian. I, I, uh, I, I, I have traveled the world and, and worked in many places, but, uh, but originally from Canada. And I did uh, most of my studies in Canada, uh, starting at UBC and then moving on to Lakehead University and then Laurentian University. Uh, essentially successively getting uh, uh, you know closer to uh, what I what I do now and what my passion is which is is exploration and working towards discovery and um, and and really that was it as I was doing my studies I was working as a field technician for mining companies and then eventually a junior geologist for mining companies and then eventually uh, you know I was I was fully in as an economic geologist uh, working in the industry and um, it was really uh, travel and, uh, and the excitement of explore, exploration um, with the goal, the eventual goal of discovery that hooked me um, and really has been my, you know, my passion for, for more than 25 years in, 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 uh, in exploration, metals exploration. And uh, I've been you know, exploring across, I've explored uh, all the provinces, in all the provinces except for PEI, uh, 35 of the United States uh, and another 40 or 50 uh, uh, countries globally uh, lived on most of the continents and, uh, and, and, and completed exploration in those places. Um, I've been really lucky and, and uh, uh, to have worked with uh, so many great uh, teams. Uh, the team that I work with now at BHP and so many other teams uh, over, my, over my career. Um, which, and, and I say lucky there because it, it, it really is luck. Uh, you know, sure there's hard times and some difficulty in, 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 in exploration and in geoscience and in, in the market, um, but being uh, ready and eager uh, in the right place, uh, the, your time will come along. So essentially you make your own luck by being ready for it. And uh, the photo here is, is me, uh, with my team, I think in 2016 or 2017, uh, doing porphyry copper exploration on the Alaska Peninsula, on the Aleutian uh, Islands, and uh, and and that's the that's the part that I really love. It's funny though, I, I I had a hard time finding a field picture of myself, partially because I spend too much time in the office, but uh, but also because I'm usually the one taking the photographs <laughs> um, uh, of everyone else. So so. Uh, so I did find one one there uh, that was that was uh, had to, at least had some mountains or something in the background. Um, next slide, please. So on the next slide, talking uh, switching a little bit to nickel, um, uh, nickel sulfides uh, is is mostly what I do, but I have uh, worked across uh, nickel sulfides and nickel laterites. But essentially, uh, you know, nickel essentially comes in two forms or in two two deposit types. It is found in other things, uh, you know, hydrothermal nickel is a thing and, 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 uh, and can yield deposits. Uh, but the majority of the deposits, the majority of the exploration and production comes from magmatic sulfides, uh, which uh, host uh, is primarily nickel, but uh, have substantial amounts of cobalt, copper, uh, platinum, palladium, gold, uh, and, and other byproducts. They're generally small tonnage, rare, uh, and, and high, higher grade, uh, and they're generally high value per ton. Uh, laterite nickel is uh, usually a nickel uh, plus cobalt, um, where, where the, the nickel is, is the primary driver of, of, of all value from, or most value from the, from the deposits. They're large tonnage, they're lower grade uh, in general, and they're lower value per ton uh, for the most part. 
Um, a laterite nickel is, is uh, characterized by some, some difficulties uh, in, uh, in processing and metallurgy, uh, which, which then influences recoveries, which then reduces their overall, again, value uh, as deposits uh, of nickel relative to, to nickel sulfides, uh, even though they're much larger and, uh, in my opinion, easier to find. Um, so uh, along those lines, the, the, the figures here, um, just quickly, figure one top left shows cumulative global nickel production um, from, uh, from uh, to up to 2020 and then forecasted nickel uh, uh, demand uh, beyond uh, 2020 to 2040. Uh, and, uh, and, and essentially uh, that's the result that, that, uh, that, that uh, increasing uh, demand is uh, a result of global economic growth and vastly increased usage of nickel uh, around, uh, uh, mostly around electric vehicles, batteries, uh, but also really high end uh, uh, um, uh, steels. And then uh, figure two, uh, bottom left, is uh, uh, of nickel, essentially nickel discovered from 1900 to 2016. And of course there's some error here, it's not all reported, but there's an estimate there for, for unreported nickel uh, discovery. And it's divided between uh, nickel laterite and, and, and nickel sulfides. And uh, essentially you can see from that figure that after a real peak in, in the middle of that chart in the, in the, in the 60s and 70s, uh, it's been sort of on and off since then, but a lot less overall uh, discovery and, uh, and, and certainly a laterite dominance in those later years, uh, which leads to our current uh, situation, which is the, the, the last map on the right hand side there that, uh, that essentially has nickel production uh, by jurisdiction and, uh, and then the, the wheel is uh, the, the, the amount of that that was laterite and the amount of that that was nickel sulfides. Canada uh, and, and, uh, and a few others, dominantly nickel sulfides, whereas uh, you know, uh, New Caledonia and, uh, and uh, Indonesia are, are dominated by laterites, uh, some other countries with, with a mixture. And then the percentage in the middle is the percentage of, of production uh, for, for uh, um, nickel sulfide, or sorry, nickel for that year. And, uh, and we'll, uh, we'll jump on to the next slide. So essentially the, the story on, on the nickel sulfides is that, that we, we need to find more, uh, nickel sulfides and nickel laterites. And I think that's the, that's the story for all uh, of our critical uh, metals going forward. Um, for, for batteries and for essentially for, for our, our diversified and, 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 uh, and, and more sustainable uh, future, uh, electric vehicles, uh, more, more rail and, and, uh, and, and more electronics, obviously. And so, um, so, so the need for that is really uh, the, the, the fact that we need, we need growth. We need to explore more we need to find uh, more and the things that we find need to be of higher quality. And uh, BHP is, 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 uh, is, is taking this market um, necessity and uh, recognizing it and from a, a real strong um, foundation uh, based on some, some great world-class deposits for, for nickel and copper is really building a growth, found, a growth uh, future. Um, and, and BHP is, uh, as it says here, the world's largest diversified mining company by market cap. Uh, it produces iron ore, petroleum, copper, uh, met coal, potash, and nickel, along with all of the byproducts that come along with those. And, uh, and, and, and also from, from some of the mines that you can see in some of the figures down there, uh, some, some world-class mines of Olympic Dam, uh, Escondida, and, uh, and, and Nickel West. And uh, we are poised for growth uh, on this journey that we're doing. And, and hence, the, we've opened a new office here in Toronto, and we'll be expanding uh, that growth uh, as, we, as we build our teams and, and expand our 
global horizon for, for nickel and copper uh, exploration. And so I'll just throw it out there since, since this is here um, that, uh, that we, uh, we are recruiting, actively recruiting uh, for, for our geoscience teams and, uh, in, in Tucson, Arizona, uh, Santiago, Chile, uh, Perth, Western Australia, and, uh, and here in Toronto. Uh, and, uh, and yeah, I look forward to, uh, to, to, the, to the expansion and exploring for these uh, interesting metals as we, uh, as we move into the, this new sustainable future. Excellent. Thank you, Joel. I appreciate that. Um, that's a great note to end on. And um, uh, with our panelists' introductions, um, I, I see we have a number of questions in the chat. And while we are sorting through them to figure out which ones to ask of which panelists, I want to sort of start us off with just a round robin of, of one question uh, to all of you. I mean, we're looking specifically at at four of the minerals that are gonna be key to meeting the demands of the energy transition. You know, the two kind of sexy ones, cobalt and lithium, uh, and then the two workhorses, nickel and graphite. Um, I, I was struck by your comment, Andrew, that, um, that uh, graphite is, you know, that, that, uh, that, that you're uh, the only industrial uh, uh, mining geologist uh, on the panel, but I would say that we are all going to be industrial mining geologists as we go <laughs> toward building these better batteries. So I think that is the, the nature of the future. So, um, but anyway, uh, I'd like to start by asking each of you in turn, um, where you see the opportunities sort of building off of Joel's last slide for economic geologists entering this field and interested in pursuing critical minerals for the energy transition, where do you see the opportunities for economic geologists? And I mean, not only geographically, but in what phase of the exploration and mining projects do you think there are going to be opportunities for economic geologists? And I'm gonna start at the top since uh, Joel just got a chance to, to take a rest. I'll, I'll start with Murray. Okay, well, I think that the opportunities are multiple and many. Um, for almost all of the ones we're talking about today, there are a whole host of juniors that have sprung to life in the last several years looking for either combinations or individual ones of these metals. So there certainly are a number of junior companies out there working, um, certainly in Canada and the United States and Australia, um, but they're working in other parts of the world too. We have them here in Europe as well. So I'd say that sector is one certainly to look at. Um, several of these metals, uh, are not being looked at by the majors. <laughs> uh, cobalt is one that comes to mind. Certainly there's a number of majors who would love to find cobalt as a byproduct, but they're not looking for it as a primary metal. So, you know, that'd be one thing. Graphite is special. Uh, it is still an industrial mineral. I'll let Andrew talk <laughs> to that, but, but, but I, I do see, I, I just think there's lots and lots of opportunities, certainly in the exploration space. Let me also say in the, in the academic space, in terms of studying these, these minerals and how they form, um, there's huge opportunities too. There's an awful lot of research money sloshing around and a lot, a lot in Europe here in the last couple of months as Horizon Europe has come into play uh, of, of money for students to work on this. Great, thank you, Murray. Um, Andrew, how about you? Since uh, Murray mentioned graphite, what do you see as where are the opportunities for economic or industrial mining geologists in the space? Edith, uh, following on from what Murray said, I must agree that uh, certainly in my space, with uh, particularly graphite, the small end of town with the small explorers are the people who have been looking for these things. The majors haven't really done anything specific with graphite. Uh, probably the biggest one was uh, Imaris, a big industrial mineral company. With, um, they've got mined graphite in Canada and they did start something up in Namibia which has since died. So yes, I agree with Murray and my field, a lot of the small places or companies are the place to start. And I think if you work for one of those small companies, you'll also get an exposure across quite a wide range of disciplines. Um, 
So that would be my my way to go. Probably, uh, I'm not aware of. Uh, yeah, I, I, as I say, I just got into it by accident anyway. <laughs> After, just uh, these things. Uh, one of you guys mentioned you've got to have luck. Yes, you've got to make it happen. And um, just to quickly round off that story about the toy shop I had for three years in the early 90s. After I'd been selling toys and I enjoyed doing it and all the rest of it, and I thought I'd better get back to geology because I actually like rocks. And uh, a friend of mine found a spodumene deposit in South Africa. And I started hawking it around to various companies, including glass manufacturers. And in the end, an industrial minerals company decided they were interested. They employed me as a geologist. And uh, I got into uh, various other minerals via that, became their sales manager, went into bentonite, which is one of the clay that uh, is my favorite mineral. And um, I ended up in Australia and working for the biggest bentonite company in the world. So it's hard to plot a course except take opportunities is my, you know, you can take an opportunity, you often don't know where it's gonna lead. I've lost my job previously and in fact, at the time that I went to the toy shop, I'd lost my job. I had some options, decided to go for the toy shop. If I hadn't have done that, I wouldn't have got into Bentonite and wouldn't have got to Australia. So, <laughs> <laughs> I know. I, I, I often, that's, that's often the response to that question of where do you see the opportunities? I think it's really an individual question. It's up to each of us as individuals to, to visualize those opportunities and to recognize them when they pop up because you yes. never know where they're going to. <laughs> Absolutely. And even negative things like losing jobs and yep. all the rest of it. It's amazing what doors it can open. Mm -hmm. There's opportunity and change for sure. Yeah. Yes. So uh, I, I can't say where to find a job except there are opportunities out there and go for it. Yep. Great. Excellent. And I know, uh, Joel, we've already heard your, um, your comments on this. So I'm going to ask Felipe to uh, see what he is uh, finding for opportunities for economic geologists uh, in the lithium triangle. Uh, yeah, I, I also agree with Murray, Andrew, uh, particularly to talking about uh, lithium, uh, just, to, just to give you a context in Chile. Nowadays, lithium is only being extracted from the Atacama salt flats. I mean, just one, one salt flat, salt flat. And uh, it, it seems that there's a project that will be extracting from another salt flat soon, not yet. Uh, but we have a lot of salt, other salt flats in Chile and also in the Argentina, as you might know, and uh, Bolivia. Uh, so there's a great opportunity for exploration in there. Uh, but also uh, salt flats have another, uh, another edge, which is related with the environment. So for every geologist that is interested in more environmental uh, studies, the, that's also really important in the case of uh, extraction mm. of brine. And, uh, and also I would like to make a point on what Murray said, uh, said about uh, academic studies. Uh, it's at least for what I've seen here, it's really important to have a, a, a more scientific view of the place in which we're extracting brine because it's not just uh, put a well wherever you want and extract brine as, as, as you want. <laughs> uh, you need to understand how the, the place geologic and hydrogeologically works. Uh, so the key factor for that, in my opinion, is to tell good studies from a more scientific point of view, uh, so that uh, after, afterwards, when the project starts extracting uh, brine in this case, uh, they really uh, do it in a correct way with uh, and monitoring wells put, uh, put in the correct places. Uh, we, I could talk about uh, also uh, lithium extracted from, from rock, uh, but uh, I know there are a lot of projects uh, being uh, held and uh, being developed in, right now in Europe, for instance. Uh, but uh, that, that's also one uh, key opportunity I'm thinking about because at least in Chile and Argentina, there are almost no, there is no, almost no exploration being done related to lithium in rocks. Uh, there are some you know, lithium projects related to rocks in, in Brazil and Mexico also, but uh, not here in Peru also, I think there's one project, but uh, that's also an opportunity for exploration geologists in here. So Felipe, before I um, uh, uh, ask Joel to unmute and answer the question, I have a follow-up question for you that's a little more technical. Um, mm -hmm. Some members of our audience have been wanting to know what is the main source of lithium in the brines? 
um, in the Solaris of Chile. And at what grade is lithium brine economic? Uh, okay, I, I, could you please repeat me the second question? At what grade is the grade. lithium okay. economic? Okay, sure. Um, okay, about the, the first question, uh, that's a really interesting question. I, I, I believe it's not been answered yet in the, in the sense we know where the lithium might come from. We know there are some uh, sources from where it, it must come, but we actually, we're actually not certain yet from where it comes. And just to try to explain myself, uh, you need to have evaporation for the water to concentrate salts and ions so that uh, in, at some point, the lithium is concentrated to the point where we are finding it right now in the Atacama salt flats. But uh, studies that have been uh, done in here, they show that uh, that's not enough. Uh, I mean, just by evaporation, you wouldn't have uh, got the, the grades that we are uh, seeing right now. So the, there must be some other source of lithium uh, that uh, is giving us the lithium needed to, to get the, the grade we have right now. And uh, before talking about that, mm -hmm. I just want to make clear also that brine in the Atacama sulfur is not uh, from yesterday. I mean, it, it, it's been there for tens of thousands of years and maybe more. So it's been a long, really long process to concentrate the lithium uh, to, the, to the grade where we have find it now. So some other sources of lithium, uh, there are two mainly being discussed, one related to geothermal activity and uh, maybe also related with uh, uh, structures uh, that cut down into, into the crust and that are able to transport this, uh, this richer uh, lithium fluid. And the other one is lithium found in some rocks where, which we haven't found yet, but maybe if you have rocks in the, in the volcanic zone, just next to the solar, and uh, by weathering, you can remove that lithium. At some point, you will be able to concentrate it uh, to, the, to the grade we need. So those are mainly the three uh, sources, evaporation, geothermal activity, and uh, right. this weathering from rocks, okay? And to what grade, uh, it's, it's interesting for us. Uh, actually, just to make it, uh, to give you a number, it'll, the brine that is going to the pools where we start evaporating this, this brine with extracted, it has a more or less a 0.18% of lithium. That's the concentration. Of course, we can extract uh, concentrations even lower than that. And the uh, other salars in Argentina are extracting even lower than that. Uh, but uh, the main goal is not actually just that what's the grade of the extracted brine, but at what grade we can move it forward to. And the grade it gets when we take it out from the pools, it's about a six cent uh, concentration of, of this. So uh, the grade will all, always depend on the on how lithium is product, pr product, produced in, the, in each company. Uh, but it, that, those numbers are just to give you more or less an example. Yeah, great. Wow, I can, I can sense that there are a lot of people who are going to click on your LinkedIn connection and ask you many more questions, Felipe. Um, but I'd like to ask Joel to unmute. And I have, um, I, I'd like to offer you the opportunity to um, expand on, on the opportunity question. But also, we have a technical question for you related to um, nickel. And that is, what are some of the processing issues for nickel in laterites? as compared with sulfides. So those two topics, Joel, you have the room. Sure. Um, so first, I think, you know, there's nickel sulfide and nickel laterite, nickel exploration jobs. Um, you know, nickel brownfields exploration is mostly around the sites. And those sites are mostly in the countries I showed, mostly in the known belt, Sudbury, Thompson, Voices Bay and Raglan in Canada, uh, you know, Western Australia and Australia. Uh, and then, uh, you know, certain places in Brazil, uh, certain places in China, etc. Uh, but then exploration is done in, for nickel in, in, in a lot of countries, um, but mostly from one of the sort of junior and major mining centers. So most uh, nickel companies and therefore most nickel geologists, if you can call them that, 
uh, are, are you know, based in Toronto or Perth or, um, uh, or Vancouver, perhaps. Uh, th those are, are kind of the main, main places. Um, yeah, so, so that, that's where. And then where in career or, you know, how do we, how do we uh, uh, say, you know, what's the access point for economic geologists into nickel sulfides? Well, you know, it, it could be anywhere. Again, I, I think I, I agree with, with the rest of the panel on, you know, there, there are a lot, we're not doing enough research in nickel sulfides or in nickel laterites because mostly because there's not enough students. In the past, it was perhaps because there wasn't enough funding, but it's, it's mostly because there's not enough students. And I know BHP and my former company, Vale, we had a lot of difficulty getting research projects going because there was a lack of students. And, uh, and so, so I think that academia is a place, is for, especially for, you know, to build a career, to laterally move at whatever age, but laterally move and, 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 and then come back into the industry perhaps. Um, in, into into the, the active exploration industry. Um, and then, like I said, the brown fields and green fields is such a mixture. Um, and, and you need everyone from people who are gonna be focused on one ore body or one part of an ore body, all the way through to, you know, looking globally for, for nickel sulfide. So there's many entry points, but but essentially, it's it's just an interest, and uh, and then and then getting on with a company that that's doing that, and and there are a lot right now, so it's certainly a good time. For yeah. That. On the uh, on the uh, specific question about nickel laterites, so nickel sulfides are for the most part that's that's uh, you know uh, a pyrometallurgy uses a smelter, you know breaks down, um, you know, and and those that has been the common way that we've gotten nickel. Uh, out of uh, out of rocks, out of nickel sulfides, um, for the last uh, probably since the uh, 40s. Before that, it was through through open roasting and other ways of that. Um, and and that does that is a really well known process that that drives forward and and gives us known recoveries for 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 known amounts of metal in the rock, and and is is just a very well known process that has been done for many, many years. And a lot of the maintenance and costs and those sorts of things are understood and they're built in and baked in when you make a project. The issue with, with nickel laterites is it beyond you know, the value per ton and other things, but directly on the, the processing um, is that it, it generally has, been, it's generally done by hydrometallurgy uh, or, or some other process that is very, uh, um, you know, energy intensive. So, uh, you know, you need to be close to, to relatively cheap, uh, uh, consistent sources of power, and you need a lot of reagents. And those reagents are very difficult to, um, to, to forecast for maintenance and for uh, supply and those sorts of things. And what that does is it means that it's an inconsistent process or it's inconsistent over time or it's very difficult to bake into the project costs. So okay. quite often you have these surprise costs that come up along the way. And if you've already got a marginal deposit that can usually drive a deposit into, into a, a, you know, negative uh, a cost as the nickel market fluctuates mm -hmm. uh, because them being, the laterites being mostly nickel and very, other, uh, very few other byproducts of course, they're only dependent on the nickel uh, price okay. and nickel demand rather than nickel sulfides, which usually have copper, platinum, palladium, gold, which then they can balance between those different markets. Yeah, fascinating. Murray, I see you've been busy answering questions in the chat, but uh, I'm gonna put you on the spot here and just ask if you wanna briefly comment on the question about, um, which seemed to get a lot of interest, um, about uh, uh, deep sea mining of cobalt, um, but also um, would love to know your thoughts on the opening and thawing of Greenland and its impact on these markets. Okay, let me, let me you know, they're very different answers. So let me yeah, take them <laughs> one at a time. Um, in terms of deep sea mining, there's no question, there's, there's huge amounts of cobalt, especially in the nodules. Uh, less so in the volcanogenic massive sulfides that we know of. 
out on the ocean and the crusts as well as the nodules. Um, thus far, as far as I'm aware, they're metallurgically still very difficult to extract the individual metals out of those crusts and nodules. And the crusts especially, I mean, they're very thin crusts and how we mine those at those depths, you know, mining a less than a centimeter of material off a rock substrate, um, that's gonna be a real trick. Uh, some sort of vacuum cleaner at the bottom with a polisher or something. What I, what I really worry about though is, you know, we, we mined on the, on, on the shore, uh, on the land for the last couple of hundred years. And people are pretty upset with what we did mining wise, right? We left a lot of historic sites that to be quite blunt are pretty bad. So now we're going to move into the ocean, which, you know, we, we actually know less about the bottom of the ocean than we know about the face of the moon. And we're going to start mining there where we don't understand the ecology. We don't understand what's happening there biologically whatsoever. To me, that seems like a pretty dumb thing to do personally. So I would say we stick to the, stick to the shore until we can mine properly on shore. And then let's think about going offshore. Fair point. Second. Second, Greenland. Um, Greenland has absolutely spectacular geology. I've been there a couple of times and one of my favorite places on the planet. It is changing very rapidly. It has potential for a number of the things we're talking about here <laughs> and other uh, energy critical elements. Um, but it is still in a very expensive jurisdiction to operate and to mine in. So, I think, I think it's still for the future. I think it'll be the juniors probably exploring still at the moment. Uh, the, the majors have gone in on particular things, uh, but I think it'll be the juniors that, that actually probably open it up and find the first real deposits that we're gonna go after. But there's no doubt that the deposits are there, right? Yeah. Um, that they're, they're definitely there. Yep. We'll have to see what, how well we do at arresting uh, our warming and how much of Greenland is exposed. Um, so um, I, I have a question now for Andrew from the audience. And um, it's one that's very near and dear to my heart because like Murray, I am a, a crossover from the petroleum geology world. And I see us as moving from an energy storage device that we blow up to get the energy from hydrocarbon bonds to an energy storage device of which all of the pieces of it are still reusable after, um, you know, after our Tesla battery goes dead, we still have metals there that are reusable. And the question for you, Andrew, is, um, is there any reason that recycled graphite cannot meet battery grade specs um, as well as natural graphite? Uh, so recycled graphite could be um, synthetic graphite or natural graphite from the batteries. They use them in about equal quantities uh, as a rough estimate. I think for me, the big thing would be, I guess it could be usable as long as you can make it the correct purity. That has to be very high purity for batteries. And with current design, if you're going to replace natural graphite, they'd want to make spherical graphite. So I don't know if you're familiar with that, but um, they take flat graphite that's less than 150 microns in diameter. Uh, so it's 150 and finer. And they put it through a type of mill that make, rolls the graphite into little potato shaped balls. They're slightly irregular sort of potato beer. And the graphite is sort of wrapped around each other in these little balls. And they're probably about 10 microns in diameter. So. I think if you could actually extract graphite, you'd have to purify it and then somehow get it to the right size to fit in. So that's going to be the trick. I can't, yeah, I can't say much more than that really, except it would have to meet the specification required by the battery people, which is going to be size and purity. But I think it's a good idea. Yeah, I, I think that's going to be, and we're going to hopefully offer that as one of our topics in this series is how are we gonna to need to use our geologic skills and our mineralogical skills and our crystallographic skills in understanding this recycling process that's going to become more and more important. Yeah. Thank you, if I could just mention recycling, it's become quite a thing generally with industrial minerals, apart from metallic minerals or metals. Um, 
people are looking at recycling glass and all sorts of other things and ceramics for use in other applications than their original application. And uh, if anybody's interested, there are some conferences, uh, annual ones to do with recycling of uh, industrial minerals and I can point them in the right direction. That'd be great, that'd be great. And I'll just take that opportunity, thank you, Andrew, to tell everyone again, um, we, are, we are in the last half hour of our session. And so we will be um, continuing with questions and, and answers and, and we have some wrap up information as well. But I just wanna remind those of you who do have to leave, please, the LinkedIn contacts are, are in your chat. Um, you are welcome to look up and correspond with any of our panelists and ask any questions one-on-one -on -one, uh, that we haven't been able to answer here. And, and what I thought I'd do now is there are a number of questions that are just sort of, uh, let's, let's say one sentence answers, everyone. How about that? Can we all agree on that? And we'll do a, we'll do a fast round robin of some of these uh, remaining questions. So um, Joel, uh, does nickel have a bigger future supply of, uh, than, a, a bigger future uh, use, I guess, than cobalt and graphite and batteries? In, in batteries, no. So nickel has a base market, which mm -hmm. batteries are building on top of, as do the others. Uh, but no, I'd say they're, they're, they're equally important, even though they can be substituted. Right. Uh, they, they, they're, they're all equally important, I think. Okay. All right. Here's one. Um, I'm not sure who this is for, but it's a great question. Are the spodumene deposits in northern Quebec competitive in the current lithium market? Who would like that one? Anyone? The spodumene in Northern Quebec, is it competitive? Uh, I, don't, I don't know what the grades are, but I'd certainly say the grades are quite important. It's interesting, we mentioned grades earlier, the comparison, don't remember, uh, you mentioned for the brines. So if the brines are 0.18 or whatever the percent is, the spodumene deposit, in my opinion, needs to be at least 1% Li2O, to be of any interest to mine hard rock. So I don't know how the Canadian ones fit in with that. Fair and Philippe enough. has and, something to say. I would say um, also locate, location, logistics. Yes. yes. Yep. Okay, um, again, another one for whom I don't know this would be intended, but uh, um, what is the depositional mechanism of cobalt, that sounds like you, Murray, in layered intrusions? That's actually Joel, but that's okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, Joel, I, I mean, I think we'd say the same thing. So cobalt, like the other metals, basically goes into the sulfide melt okay. and gets, gets captured with the rest of the metals in the sulfide melt. Yep. Could I ask something quickly, please? What's the general difference in grade between a nickel laterite and a nickel sulfide? I know that's a very broad <laughs> that, that is pretty broad, but in general, like, uh, you know, a threshold for a good uh, nickel sulfide would be, uh, you know, over 2% nickel uh, or over 2% nickel equivalent if it had good, yeah. good mm -hmm. uh, byproducts. And nickel laterites, although they do, uh, uh, saprolite zones are often over 2% nickel. Uh, in general, the, the, the large tonnage world class uh, uh, laterites are usually somewhere, uh, they have to be over a percent nickel. If they're not, they're really a, a, a dirt moving exercise for mm -hmm. this one. Okay. So Thanks. Felipe, I have one for you. Tell me about how brine processing impacts local water supply. That's a really, really good question uh, <laughs> because it should be of interest for, <laughs> for every one of us. Um, at least for, the, for what we have studied in Salar de Atacama, and I'm talking just about uh, Atacama salt plus, okay? Um, the nucleus I showed you before is kind of separated from the water aquifer through this marginal zone I told you. So first, extracting brine from the nucleus is not the same as extracting water from the uh, alluvial aquifer, okay? We, we need to separate those, those things. Still, the marginal zone is, it works like a buffer zone, okay? It, it has a really low transmissivity. So we have to monitor that uh, exactly brine extraction 
will not have any impact on the water levels outside this. But uh, the place, ex the exact place where we extract brine is located in the western side of the nucleus. We are about at least 20 to 25 kilometers far from, the, from where the water aquifer starts. So just by, uh, because just by extraction, uh, water aquifer is, is practically not being affected. About the production itself, uh, to the whole production process of lithium, at least in Salada Atacama, SQM uh, has about, uh, extract about 2% of the water rights of the basin. We're talking about a really, really low uh, volume, okay? And this water is extracted from the alluvial zone I showed you before. So that's the only or, or, or the mainly uh, mm -hmm. impact we could generate in the water availability of the basin. But, I, but, uh, but as I told you, it's 2% of the rights that are, that are given in the basin, uh, what we extract more or less. I mean, there's, an, there's a still, there's a sustainability plan uh, that uh, looking forward to uh, go lower down that number. Yeah, gotcha. Thank you, that's, that's really important. Gentlemen, we have a phenomenal number of additional questions, but we just don't have time to answer any more today because I want to give you each a chance to have a final word of your own. Um, uh, I, I want to um, uh, challenge you to, um, in, a, in a few sentences, to leave um, our group, and I'm gonna warn you, I'm going in reverse order. So Joel, you're gonna be on deck first. Um, leave our group of, uh, at one time, over 150 participants with a reason to look you up on LinkedIn and talk further. So um, your final words uh, as part of this webinar, starting with Joel, and then we'll go to Andrew uh, Felipe, and we'll let Murray uh, back clean up for us. So Joel. Your final thoughts for our participants. Okay, uh, I guess that's, that's an odd question, but um, I guess uh, if you're interested in, uh, you know, a career in magmatic sulfur, looking for magmatic sulfides or for porphyry coppers or just in exploration in general, uh, then you should, uh, you know, send me a message on LinkedIn and I will, uh, you know, I'll answer any questions or, you know, direct you towards anything that I can think of that might help you with your career. I think I'll give a note and this was something I did prepare, but um, Good. Please, so do. please, you know, I, I think if I could give any advice to anybody uh, for, for, for a career is, uh, you know, don't be, don't be too prescriptive on what your sequence it's uh, you know I read an article the other day it was really great it was about uh, careers now being a braided stream instead of a tunnel and I think that that's very true right we need to we need to build we need to be able to move laterally in order to be able to to learn and move on and and so you know balance it balance your confidence uh, with with humility your ambitions and your ambition with patience and most importantly, your professional and your personal lives. Thanks. That's all. Excellent. Lovely. Thank you so much, Joel. Um, Andrew. That's a hard act to follow. <laughs> uh, I think you've just got to seize every opportunity. And I do like that uh, the analogy with the braided stream. Uh, I must say, the things that have been best for me in my career has been working in diversified companies where I get exposed to things other than geology. Um, yeah. I, I think that's really important is to get a broad overview of where the minerals come from and where do they go to and how they're used rather than just sticking in a little silo. So yes, and I think take every opportunity you can. Can't think of much more than that. Oh, give, industrial minerals, can... give industrial minerals a go. I, I, I love that, that, that last sentence. I think, uh, I think that's so germane to where we find ourselves today. So Felipe. That's one thing, could I oh, quickly so, just finish okay. off? One thing is my favorite mineral is this stuff called bentonite, which is volcanic ash. And that's gonna have applications in various things like a heat pumps for uh, yes. keeping buildings, uh, moderating the temperature. Mm -hmm. So all I wanted to say was, the metals and minerals we've talked about today are only a fraction of the things that are going to be in the new 
there's rare earth, there's all sorts of stuff. So you've got to take the opportunity and things are growing. Yep. Thanks. That's a wonderful, wonderful note to end on. Thank you, Andrew. I appreciate that. Uh, Felipe. Um, well, I, I would also like to say that uh, if I could help anyone from the audience, either a student or an early career professional, please just write me. I can, I can answer your questions gladly. And uh, as some closing words, uh, I would say that uh, maybe I, I could recommend to always think beyond the box, uh, never underestimate yourself and uh, be certain that geology or geoscience uh, has room for everyone, either if you like the lab, the field, uh, analysis, analysis or anything, or basic science maybe, uh, there's always room for everyone. So just uh, go ahead and look out for your, for your dreams. Wonderful. Thank you, Felipe, for that kind offer as well. I think that is one of the things I love about our business and this industry is that we are all um, out to, to reach out a hand to each other and we're just excited about the rocks and the mines. So, Murray, bring us home. So oh, it's tough. Everybody said a lot of good things. So on the technical side, I'd like to sort of echo what Felipe just said, but say in a different way, especially with these, these new elements, new minerals, um, new minerals that we're trying to find, some of which we've been looking for for a long time, but haven't been a focus of what we've been doing and maybe aren't the focus of the majors. Think about deposits that we've never thought about before, right? There are deposits, world-class deposits of everything we've talked about today that we have never seen, we've never thought of, right? We just don't know that they're there because no one's ever looked. And you might be the geologist that actually figures that out, okay? By happenstance or by being really smart or all sorts of combinations of things. It's happened in my lifetime with several different kinds of deposit types. So it does happen, right? There's no question. The, the second thing I guess I'd like to close with is I'm an educator, or I've spent part of my life doing that. And one of the things we haven't talked about here much is, is the social side of mining. Um, you could tell from my answer about the subsea, I, I think about that a lot. And my career in industry and in government has forced me to think about that a lot. So one of the things I'd like everybody to do is to talk to their family and friends and, and try and express to them why you actually love being a geologist. Right, and why you like working in this industry and why this industry is important. Because it is, if we're gonna actually get the world to where we need to be by 2020, by 2050, um, geologists are gonna be really key to getting us there, right? And so you should be really proud to be part of the solution, not the problem. Well done, <laughs> well said, all of you. Um, I, I cannot thank you all enough. I want to say again, um, we have a few concluding slides, and so I will ask um, uh, Deanne to begin to show those. But for all of the wonderful questions that we had um, in the Q&A that we weren't able to get to, please, please consider reaching out to ask your questions of the, the individuals that you have just met over this virtual cup of coffee. Um, so before we close completely, I just wanna remind you, if you are not yet a member of SEG, the Society of Economic Geologists is an international scientific association. We've been around for a hundred years and our members come from industry, academia, government institutions. We are a unique and diverse network of professionals. So please join us and, and take advantage of our membership benefits including the community connections like the ones today, education, training, scholarly publishing. The, the journal, the Economic Geology is, is one of the first uh, journals that I was assigned to read in Minac and Thermo. So um, it's, it's a fantastic uh, publishing conferences, student benefits. We, we have over 500,000 annually in student support, over 100 student chapters in 33 countries. So SEG is a wonderful organization and I just invite you to consider membership if you are not already one of our beloved members. So Deanne, uh, I think the, um, the next slide, please. Um, I also want to just a brief reminder of upcoming events in May on Monday 
abstracts are due for our 100th anniversary conference, which will be held as a hybrid virtual meeting uh, in, in Whistler. So please, if you would like to contribute to one of the interesting themes for our 100th anniversary conference, get your abstract in by May 3rd. And we have a number of other events coming up, um, including uh, we're uh, helping to sponsor the Ore Deposits Hub's big Kickstarter uh, at the end of May. Um, all of these events and information on how to, to register or participate are on our website at scgweb.org um, slash webinars. So our last slide, please. Please, Deanne. Um, I just want to say one more time a heartfelt thank you to everyone who attended today, and most especially, um, well, just like uh, Southwest always says, you know, we, we, we particularly love our, our SEG members, but um, the gentlemen on our panel today, Felipe, Murray, Joel, and Andrew, um, we cannot thank you enough for sharing your inspiring stories and bits of advice and observations of, of your, your years uh, wandering uh, down that braided stream. Uh, I saw so many comments um, in the chat about what a wonderful analogy that is. Um, so thank you, thank you all. And I'm really pleased to announce that the next um, event um, in, this, um, uh, in this series will be on batteries. We're going to be um, uh, really getting out to the bleeding edge of looking at battery development and its possible impact on markets for new metals. We're going to be um, talking about how um, some of the skills that maybe are a little rusty, but that we learned in, in undergraduate, our mineralogy crystallography, are being uh, called on to help us build better batteries and what that will mean for the metal markets if suddenly we find a substitution for cobalt, say. So um, that should be a very interesting one. It's going to be July 8th at the same time, same place with apologies um, for that early cup of coffee, Andrew. Um, but we hope we, we um, have picked a time that, that works best for as many members and guests as we can squeeze on board. So um, with that final note, I'll just remind you one last time that the event has been recorded and it will be available um, on the SEG website in the archive section or on the SEG YouTube channel. And I will ask you all participants one final favor before you log off for good, please do fill out our feedback survey so that we can improve our webinars in the future. You will be taken to the landing page when you log off and we would very much appreciate your feedback. So again, Felipe, Joel, Murray, Andrew, thank you all so much. Deanne and Duncan, thank you for your behind the scenes support. I'll say uh, goodbye to everyone at this time and we will see you in July.